as the first one. The first one is actually an ACM Six Soft Impact Paper Award. Uh, that is an annual award uh, presented uh, to a paper that was yeah, presented at a uh, Six Soft conference well, at least 10 years ago. And there are a Six Soft Labs committee, so there is an award committee which uh, deals with this award, and anyone can uh, do nominations. And this year, uh, the award goes to a paper from uh, 2000, uh, uh, written by Roy Fielding and Richard Taylor, who are both here, and who are award winners, for a paper titled Principled Design of the Modern Web Architecture, presented at ICSI in 2000. So, um, who of you knows this paper, or cited it, or see, quite a few, but this paper actually is, well, you could call it a summary of the PhD thesis of Roy Fielding, I think. So, who of you actually read Roy Fielding's thesis? I did, actually. So, I did it in 2006, so six years after the thesis was published, I felt the need to read this thesis, and that doesn't happen too often with a thesis, I think, that six years after someone from a small country in the Netherlands starts reading the thesis. Well, this thesis deals with REST. Who of you heard of REST, use REST? Everyone, right? So this is major index uh, uh, described in this thesis, and that's also why well, many people, of course, still read that thesis. And it's a beautiful thesis, so I've used this thesis as an example in many cases where it deals with properties, configurations uh, that uh, combine uh, architectural elements. And it's a wonderful thesis, wonderful setup, so it's great that this uh, work is now presented here in this, uh, in this uh, award session. Um, Few words maybe about the award winners. Roy Fielding, uh, if you look at his Twitter handle, you will get a 140 character summary. So I'll just read it aloud and then. Uh, so he's a senior principal scientist at Adobe, co founded Apache, so who doesn't can say that? Uh, authored REST Architecture Style and Web Standards for URI, HTTP5, HTTP1, and URI templates. So that's quite a CD and it's great to have you here. Uh, Richard Taylor um, is an award collector. Sixsoft Distinguished Service in 2005, Sixsoft Outstanding Research in 2009, and now the, the, the award here. Um, if you are here, you may have noticed that there are actually many people from UC Irvine here in the audience. And I think that's for a large part can be attributed to uh, uh, Richard Taylor, who for 18 years served as the director of UCI Irvine's Institute of Software Research. So in the background, he does a lot of good things, managing people, making sure success has happened, so that's wonderful uh, as well. Uh, moreover, Richard Taylor is well known for his work on software architecture, uh, on which he co-authored uh, the book Software Architecture Foundations, Theory and Practice. So, uh, again, uh, great to have you here, and uh, Richard Taylor is well, maybe above all uh, a super PhD advisor, as is also shown today. Uh, the invitation here led uh, in fact, uh, uh, the award winners uh, to write a joint paper looking back at this paper, and that paper is listed here. The paper is part of the proceedings. You can download it, you can read it. So, as you can see, there are many authors there who all influenced uh, this work. And uh, one of them, Roy, uh, Roy Kahn, and he's also here and will co present this work. Roy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Roy. Uh, so, um, a little bit of warning first. I'm going to try to present a little bit of an overview of six different dissertations. So I might go a little fast, but I may skip a lot of details. Um, today, Dick, Dick's voice isn't, isn't working quite as well as it usually does, so um, Rohit's going to present his part of the, the talk, and also, uh, which is incredibly great for me because it contains Rohit's research in there too. Um, and that, that's a great, a great, a great help to us. So thanks for it. So let's give a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to teach you how to do REST. Um, first, because I can't do that in 15 minutes. Um, but also because we, we really wanted to, to reflect back on the impact of, of the paper that I wrote in 2000 and also the um, follow-on research that occurred after that, and to some extent, some of the, the research that was occurring around at UCI at the same time I was working on, on REST. 
So we'll look at a little bit about REST um, and some of the work that was inspired by REST and also um, some reflections on um, the software research in general, particularly the research that was done at UCI. Now, some of you, I, I assume most people are familiar with the web. Um, the original web proposal was, was uh, put together by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, invented by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. Uh, but the web itself wasn't actually developed, began developing until the end of 1990, and really wasn't publicly known until 1991, middle of 91. Uh, but his original proposal <coughs> was really an application integration system. Everyone today thinks of the web as this wonderful world of hypertext, but ultimately the, the central theme of the World Wide Web at the time was how do we get all these existing legacy systems, information systems within the um, CERN in particular, the High Energy Research Facility, how to um, get all those systems to work together and present a uniform interface to users, people who would come to the research facility at CERN for only two or three months at a time, and they would have to use these systems for a few months at CERN, and maybe six months back at their home institutions, spread all over the world. So that's the focus area. It's not so much providing the world's best hypertext system, it's providing the world's largest hypertext system, the most distributed around the world. And most importantly is this notion of unifies. The goal of the web design was to unify all these different systems in a way that provides a simple interface to all of its users. And first, a little bit of context. Um, we forget about this now, the web is so popular. Back then, it was just a small um, information system, one of many that was developed for the internet. And I started um, using the web in 1993, the beginning of 1993. And I distinctly remember the day that I first played around with it because I actually uh, browsed the entire web in one day. There was 48 <laughs> public sites that, that I knew of, at least. And um, I actually managed to get, to get through the 48 all in one day just to find at the end of the day that two more had been added. And I knew that was the, uh, the project for me because of its great growth rate. Two sites. So uh, this is a, a diagram I used just to provide some scale. Um, when I started work in, on the web, 48 websites, uh, when I started doing programming for the web, it was about uh, 300 websites. Uh, when I started doing protocol work for the web, or changing the, the web HTTP protocol to add the conditional get mechanism for caching, it was at roughly 650 websites. Um, and we had the first Polar Web Conference in May of 94, and it was a, a chance for all of the web researchers to get gathered together in Geneva. Um, and 300 people showed up, and we had a great time, most of all, because for the first time we were able to meet each other and get to know each other's needs and interests and wants in terms of the web. And it really blossomed from that point on. Um, what happened was, I was a, being a grad student at UC Irvine in California, and I was really, at the time, I was the only one working on the web protocols. And um, there were folks from all over the world who were getting interested in the web, but not really having a, a, a clear basis of, of how to get involved, how to, how to get, do work together. Uh, there was a mailing list we called www-talk that we used to coordinate all these things. And uh, we used that to develop all the, all of the features and also to coordinate these events that we had. And I started uh, getting involved in the protocol development and um, became the editor of the HTTP protocol when it became clear I was one of the most independent of the original developers and I could actually write in the web stage. And I wasn't working for a competing organization and I wasn't working for Tim Berners-Lee. So it was nice and all, in all those respects it made it possible for me to work on the HTTP and be the editor. Uh, and it led to other things, like the, um, 
as I began editing the protocol, I found that in ITF, the protocols are designed um, by a rough consensus of running code. As much as I could argue for a particular feature or another, I couldn't get it in the standard if I didn't have running code to go with it. And so as part of that, I helped uh, found the Apache Software Foundation and then the Apache HTTP Server Project. But to get back to this, the scale of this slide, um, you can see it's, it's about two meters or so up there. To, to actually represent the current number of sites on the web is about 1.8 billion. So we need a uh, screen 16 times the size of Mount Everest in order to display a graph at the current same scale. So one of, one of the things I, I come across frequently is this, this notion there are three really different perspectives of what the web is. Um, a lot of people, because they use browsers all the time, they see the browser, the web platform, as being the browser itself. And it's an interesting notion. It's probably the least uh, interesting to me, but it's the, uh, uh, it's the common feature that many people, most of the public, see as turning to the web. Um, the other thing is the information itself. The name of the web itself came from the set of information that we have um, out there in the World Wide Web as far as the information. Um, and from the development perspective, it's the protocols that are interesting the most. And you see this over time, you know, the web was a set, of, a set of browsers that were current in 1995. <coughs> it's a different set of browsers now. The web was a set of servers operating it just producing HTTP. Well, it's a different set of servers now. Apache is slow to it's, it's a very different piece of software. But there was no point in time in which the web stopped working, so we could reinstall a different system. And for, for web implementations, you know, in terms of the origin view of the web, you can see all of the different machines that are out there on the internet that are accessing systems. How, how do you focus on, on solving the problems of scalability? Many, 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 many clients per server. And how do you distribute content so it's closer to users? Things like that, the different way of viewing the web. And ultimately, um, this notion of web architecture is that we take this view of the web itself and abstract away a lot of the details so we can talk about the particular roles that each of those components play as opposed to the actual particular implementation. And it's the web protocols, particularly the web protocols that are developed in the ITF and the um, W3C, that represent the community consensus on how these systems should interact. So that's how we build it. We build consensus about how the systems will interact. Hopefully the developers go out and build their uh, individual software components so they interact in the same way that we define, and that's how we get the web architecture. So the question is, which one is the web? Because if, you talk to, if I talk to browser developers, they'll tell me about the web platform. And if I talk to content creators, they'll tell me about what, what <coughs> blogs they've written and which you know, articles they've written and what, what information is out there. And if I hang out with the main protocol crowd at the ITF, they'll, they'll talk about how great the ITF all of the consensus work that goes into creating this thing we call the web. It ultimately, it, you know, which one is that? It, it's not really any one. It's all of them, all together. The web itself isn't just a design. It's a working operating system. It's a worldwide system, constantly changing, always running, anarchically accessed, and independently developed. It's all of those things at the same time. And if we don't build our designs to reflect that inherent nature of the web, then we fail as, as software developers. So that's a little bit about the history of the web, and I'll try to quickly go through aspects of the dissertation. Um, as you probably know, there's a lot of, uh, of opinions about what REST is, and occasionally people get upset when I tell them, well, what you're talking about is, isn't REST, the desirable the term. And they say that, well, well it, it doesn't mean that in industry anymore. We use it for other different reasons. There's some validity to that. On the other hand, you know, I write dissertation, so it's, it's my yeah. Anyway, um, you can see that a lot. 
I see it, of course, every day because REST is no longer just a sign, it's a buzzword. <laughs> this is an example of, of an actual slide presented by a consultant who uh, um, what described REST in his way. And, you know. <laughs> so, uh, briefly, architectural styles, I'm sure, hopefully, most of, most of us are aware of what architectural styles are. Um, it's that horizontal abstraction across many architectures. Um, rather, it's just not, it's not one architecture, it's looking at many different architectures and finding the common features that you want to take and give a name. And you give it a name so that you can communicate about it, you can talk about it, you can evaluate what are the good characteristics of this architectural style, what are the bad characteristics, what are the good properties that it induces, what are the bad trade-offs that it induces. We give it a name so we can have a meaningful conversation and many, many interesting discussions and eventually build a, a, a thorough <coughs> set of knowledge and science about the design. Not so that we can have arguments about, well, you have to build restful systems. It's not about talking about, it's not about building restful systems. It's about building systems that have a set of properties that you want and you know you can get there by using a particular style. So, REST in particular is an accumulation of design constraints. Um, these constraints are, were selected by the nature of the web itself. You know, there's, we already had hyperdex, we already had um, uh, client server systems. Uh, we had just started to introduce caching when I, when I got um, involved in the protocol development and introduced a lot of the caching features like the digital get. And, um, we had, towards the end of this process, we started seeing mobile code being more utilized. And actually, we had mobile code in, the, in one of the very early browsers called Viola, but it was only using Viola script because it only it was pretty much isolated to that one browser. And um, each of these constraints then produce uh, properties that we want out of the, out of the architecture. And it's difficult for me to describe them all in a short period of time, but I want to particularly emphasize that what I was going for was a replication of the uniform type and filter architecture. So you all familiar with that from the Unix command line. Um, I had been a Unix sysadmin since 1983 when I started professional software development. So um, I was interested in getting the properties of the Unix command line active for the design of the web. And what that means is that you could have coroutines at various levels of the stack producing generated output, filtering that output for particular applications and providing it to users as a layered set of features. And those layers could be independently developed and independently evolved over time. That's what I was going for. It's a little hard from the, to see from this diagram because the, it's, it's actually the client server separation and applying the uniform interface that produces that type and filter design. And why, why do we want that? Most importantly, it's, it's for this notion, it's really two notions. First is simplicity, and the second is recomposability or reusability of the systems. Um, simplicity is great, everyone wants simplicity, I've never encountered a system system design where people said, nah, I don't want to be simple. Uh, but it's how you get there that's important. How, how you get to the point that, that you can obtain the properties that you want, in this case, reusability. And it's the same basic principle as Legos. Um, if you design a common interface among the components, then you can provide a lot of different types of components, various shapes and sizes, provided that they use the same interface, they can connect together and be recomposed and reused by people other than yourself. So people all over the world that we don't control can build upon the system that we've developed and create interesting things, very complex things. Now this is a, a Lego city, actually. If you don't look carefully, you can't even tell that it's a, it's a made up Lego. Same basic concept. Now in, in REST, there are specific constraints that um, make this possible. So uh, I won't go through the details of the uniform interface. It's in the paper, it's discussed online, it's great. Um, 
there is a little bit debate about the hyperdex as, as the engine of application state, but it's a really s a simple concept. Um, and we use hypertext as a way of enabling independent evolution of components by um, loose coupling. By taking, instead of building an application to match a specific server interface, we provide an application that can follow an interface one page at a time. And by only focusing on one page at a time and the transitions from that page, it results in much easier to test application. Uh, less state application, an uh, application that less, le suffers less from partial failure conditions, and it's as simple as that. It's following your notes, and that's the basic idea of hypermedia as a constraint. So in addition to these things of, that are in the REST architectural style as well, there's also other things that were going on at UCI at the same time that, that impacted REST. Uh, one example is, is WebDev. My friend, Jim Whitehead, who I shared an office with at UCI, uh, didn't have enough work to do. So when, when the authoring parts of HTTP were split off, because in, in the ITF, if you haven't implemented it, it has to be taken out of the spec. Um, so <clears throat> because authoring hadn't been extensively implemented, um, it had to go into a different working group. And I convinced Jim to be the chair of that working group. I think, he, I think he likes that still. <laughs> Anyhow, Jim was working on, on distributed authoring and versioning. He, he actually came up with a very nice uh, model as part of his dissertation of how to do hypertext versioning. But that's only a very tiny you know, amount compared to the huge amount of time he spent organizing and convincing industry to work on the web app protocol as a larger project. And that all, the, all of that work was also instrumental Finding the aspects of rest um, because our discussions fed into my dissertation and many of the definitions you'll see within it. Also, there's uh, dynamic software architectures worked by Payment or Raising. Al Payment uh, happened to share an apartment with me. So, much like with Jim's concern, we, we would have discussions about the work that we were doing. He would, he would ask me, How does extensibility work on the web? How, how do you get evolvability of the Apache server with all of its modular frameworks? And, and I would describe that, and he would describe some of the problems with that, and I would describe some of the ways that we've worked around those problems. And all that led to a great environment of collegiality and um, insight into how to define the REST architectural style in a way that would make sense to others and be complete. And I think a lot of that is why my dissertation is so popular. It's, it's kind of ridiculously popular for, for a dissertation. And um, I, I see that in utter illusion. I was told I didn't want to ever read my dissertation. That's how I managed to finish it. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's great to see, but in, and I have to thank Sigsoft for the, for the honor of this award. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Rohit now, and he can quickly describe the other so, good morning. Uh, I'm Corey Clay as a vocal understudy to Jeanette Dick Taylor. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit later on about one of the themes about independence and autonomy and entrepreneurship and the team that worked on this over the years. Uh, but I very rarely be told what to speak to. This is one of them. So, this is again reflecting our joint work and co authorship. So, he mentioned publishing the dissertation. And at that time, let's take that as 2000 as the baseline. It actually did not have the impact of media awareness that you thought it would. It's that <clears throat> it came home to practitioners, and we started seeing uh, real convincing adoption a few years later. So one thing that gives it a me is that REST became more uh, better advocated for by practitioners as it was compared to alternatives that emerged around the turn of the century. So to move the story from the 20th century, so by getting the web to work as an information system, to the 21st, as the web has become a foundation for services, we dealt in successive terms with uh, SOAP, XMLRPC, web services, uh, later on several dozen to 100 WS star specifications, um, things around Atom and Atom Pub. In each of these debates, each of these engagements, more practitioners would pick up uh, the concepts of REST and use those to solve debates. 
you public. And so this Google Trend search is uh, is what it is. It's just a sample of some keywords here, but it tells you that it was some years before it kind of crossed over that the enterprise vexation on web services um, really took off uh, took off in comparison to REST APIs. Um, starting around 2006, a couple years, about five years afterwards, you start seeing books getting published. And that up at the right there is just the 30 some books from O'Reilly. There are some uh, 100 others that I'll name on here later tonight. The, this also marks a breaking point in the original coterie of who graduated from this group. So I mentioned Ben Paymon, Jim Whitehead, and Dory Fielding, all registrations by around 2000. So we looked at three new problems. One was dealing with push. By around this time, uh, we'd seen a lot of interest in some combination of things that were called instant messaging, push notifications, event notifications, um, real-time collaboration. And it was clear that there were some gaps in how REST could be pushed and adapted into addressing them. The way I summarized them, the three of those gaps were that REST and HTTP by extension are really one shot. They involve a request response at some level, and while responses can be cached, they're very hard to reason about if they're lost entirely. One shot every try. Um, there, of course, reason about one to one that if you ask for a request, it has to come back to you. Um, if you're not kind of a group addressing primitive, you can chain proxies together in a line, but you can't just steer a message to multiple uh, to parallel. And of course, it's one way. A uh, request response implies that a response doesn't just happen out of the blue, it happens in response to something that the client is shared. This is both technically true because it's hard to push a message to a wireless device or a web browser that doesn't have the software open already or already had an issue of connection. But it's also architecturally interesting because it now changes the response to a series of values over time. So I view the core boundaries as latency, dealing with how to upgrade the constraints of rest around how we talk about time and virtual synchrony. And agency, about how do we deal with the fact that it's not just one origin server and one web browser, there are many, many parties involved and have different interests. Uh, and so by taking rest and using as a starting point that polling of rest plus p, which is the pattern we've seen, or adding streaming push responses, and things we began to see that today resulted in uh, concepts like web sockets, web RTC, web hooks, um, and adding routing, which is in some ways later spread in response to a group of servers, distributed hashing uh, was a key concept in there. And some years later we can say that that took off in new forms and Cassandra and these very popular NoSQL databases that have made distributed hash tables quite successful. And when you combine it, the asynchrony and the routing had for REST, which is a great way of talking about push and streaming, uh, asynchronous and routing with REST, but realize that if you have to come to consensus in a decentralized market, you need to estimate the value that you might have currently and distribute the response of the decision. And some of these, while I certainly can't say we've pre previewed it, are interesting to see discussed today in the form of cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain technology. Um, the blockchain being a fine example of something so peer-to-peer -peer was one theme we looked at. Another theme was realizing that computation was in some ways replacing information. So <clears throat> this is the work of Justin Aaron France in a system called Press. If you look at REST and try to generalize its core constraints in a few ways and explore what could be done. As I mentioned, push was one direction that I ran with the, the larger center on that. Mashups were an introspective that is an entry point. Just what does it mean to have a website like Housing Maps, the original Ajax mashup that's combining listings from Craigslist and a map from Google. It's not really at one server. You're really kind of moving some computation around. And do again to direct engagement with subversion and version control. We started reasoning about better performance because you can move computation around, not just try to chain and step in a way and block them. So this created the concept of the computational resource, and it comes to us talk about moving code around in a very constrained way. Um, and it's both an interesting set of results and an interesting way of doing research. Um, in this case, we certainly weren't going off in theory land alone. It was anchored in the living lab and working with tools like this version on the web and versioning and things like that. And then a third generation of uh, successor technology by uh, Michael Borlick, who we'll see later on has been involved in the program for quite a long time, but really up the baton on saying, well, if mashups are one sort of challenge, and push is one sort of challenge, cloud security has come to the forefront, and you can't just be moving computation around willy-nilly, you need to ground that in a secure cryptographic foundation. And in this case, again, there's a technology on this on the shelf in some way, capability security, so you can be familiar with it for several decades, but an architectural style that makes it easy and native to reason about capability security through creating the capability URL. Uh, 
the finder. So once you make the ability to move code around a core uh, operation, you're able to induce yet other properties. And this again was investigated in the context of fairly realistic systems and fairly realistic attack scenarios about how you might successfully still come to consensus in a fully decentralized system. So again, notice that mobile moving from information of mobile code in Crest is another form of looking at latency and performance. And moving from mobile code capabilities in Coast is a way of thinking also about agency boundaries and accommodating software architectures for multiple competing, possibly mistrustful organizations. Um, this is an important <coughs> on how the Coast style works in particular. Clearly, there's other reasons why capability URLs have not taken off in and of themselves. It's a question of how you start the environment up. Clearly, the uh, work here is about giving people convenient ways to reason about it. Setting up a channel to begin with. So, reflecting on Rust, so what's interesting about this is about not just the process of the contributions, but how we got here. I felt that one thing you'll see here is that there is a student driven process here at Tier 1. It was a case where not only did um, the environment, but not just the other professors in the environment, create space for students and entrepreneurship. It also um, was backed by funders that had the patience, patience to work on things over much longer time frame. It's important to look at this one is that nothing here happened in just a four to five year fixed tenure graduate school program. Um, so if you look at Roy's career, uh, that was probably the best role model for taking a decade to get to a dissertation. But it's uh, reflected by sustained and continuous involvement in several different standards processes. And another one is if you're going to assign a grad student not to go work for the standards group, realize that's a multi-year effort as well. The brown dots kind of represent a sense of how long it takes to culminate in that's also a lot of traveling to those ones. Right? That's working with industry partners, sometimes not just domestic but internationally, uh, along with client patients as well. The other half of it is that you can't just work through standards and debates alone, rough consensus and running code. And the foundation of the Apache project and some of the related things like the WebCap are all cases where you had grad students and collaborators at Irvine House who are writing code to co validate what we're doing. And so Apache itself has been the leading web server. Was founded in 1995 and became a formal software foundation um, with Roy's help in 2009. Jim again overlapped in the web dash works went off of that. Um, and again, you can see how much longer past his career to want to take standard there. While he turned to academia as a graduate, I must give credit for kind of his own entrepreneurship movement and creating a new uh, department of computational media at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Paymont's work, uh, of course, was incredibly very important in contextualizing for me on the web how it is that browsers load new content types and dynamically grow their skills, what then would have been mine content types for today's Chrome extension and equivalent. And the both of us, in fact, shortly spun off a company called No Now to make commercialized pubs on internet scale uh, in the middle of our program. So it's a remarkably very successful collaboration, a company that was slightly different than so. Um, in fact, later on, I, some 20 years later, now worked at Google, I was the product manager for Google Cloud Pubs on getting right back in the thick of realizing that we're finally building things that are on millions of messages per second, hopefully uh, at scale and computation. And uh, Justin's work and Michael's now extends well into the 21st century, such as it is, uh, the first decades of it. Um, but there's two last things I want to really highlight, is that the institutional support doesn't just come from our funding bodies or from the university as a whole. We're able to create some parallel structures around the former Irvine Research Institute for Software and later the Institute for Software Research. And this gave us a built-in program of audience and engagement, not just with local businesses in Southern California, but also roundtable talks and engagement with the Bay Area roundtable in New York. This kind of very genuine and organic industry cooperation, I think, is a really useful hallmark here. Uh, it's not really kind of sending co-op students back and forth. Um, and even some of these workshops here at the bottom, we actually ran a series amongst us, largely amongst junior faculty and junior grad students, the workshop under the scale of that application in 98. Workshop on Internet Scale namespaces, and these series on workshop on Internet Scale technologies were quite apart from any ACM conference or IEEE event. We had the Roma in space to create events on campus that brought the ideas from all over the world. So, <clears throat> the second aspect of the impact of looking back on this work of how Rust is considered a good software researcher, it's quite relevant to the second about how it was rejected to begin with. But I want to make quite clear. Team that this is in a different line of software engineering research than some of the mainstream, if you count the number of papers that will have a number of statistical conclusions and a number of uh, data mining projects and that sort of thing. Um, 
field work. This is one where the field work comes to an action, being deeply engaged and reflecting on our design and what the pupils want. Um, and it's a good engagement about style research, too, which is that it really can't be done in a vacuum. It actually comes through direct engagement with the community. Um, so I believe that the key quotes here from the original version of the paper, which is submitted to FSC 99, or that this is about the web, it's not much of a big deal as far as technology goes. And that's in 99. I remember that the line of rejection when I was learning about the grass in 94 and 95. And I can't throw anything this over the web, but who knows where's going back. Uh, that was one trend. Another one was this is just observational, it's just work that we're hearing. And the feedback from those reviewers was not untrue, but it involves recasting what we think of as valuable scientific and uh, software engineering research. Um, so I'd say that you know, we need to realize there's a lot of value to reflection when done properly and engaged in the community and real work, not just reflection by sitting in an armchair and looking at some built system. When we recognize elegance and clarity and the ability to convey an idea is almost as important as the ideas themselves could be. Uh, the compactness and the way of expressing these styles speaks to more of its impact over the years than just the number of lines of code that someone comments saying this works. So reflection, elegance, and that you can get valid and interesting insights from n equals one. But as you say, it's a really large system. There's so many new systems out there in the world today. At any given point, this isn't about a street, lucky street that happened because one group of students got together at one point of time and happened to join on one hot software trend in the web. I think these are around us all the time. I think that these are not moving students that are using the support for any time you get people involved or more so the impact of their work. It's not about the money or the startup companies or the action setting, but you have passion for your impact that will lead you in a new direction. You have to give space for students to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to look at uh, this, this reminder of what we say about the you know, to be able to say that an evaluation section of a paper or a dissertation largely consists of just one modest sounding sentence, that the rest of our architectural style has been validated through six years of development of the 1011 standards, in elaboration of some other standards, and deploying a couple of dozen independent commercial grade software systems by other companies that are constituted in the modern web. That's very modest and understated. And now I can look back on it and say it's a bit snarky, but it's very important to look back on it and say that is not um, uh, the result of just a uh, lab work. That's a lot of field work. So, so it's on that. And that, I think, shows we've had now 6,000 citations of the station, 2,000 of the journal paper edition, I've mentioned about hundreds of books. And, I think now about 2,000 venture backed startups that mentioned web services in their name, about 50 of which specifically call out rest as their, their corporate mission. And that is a quite a great uh, heritage that we're here. So, from that, I want to make sure to thank uh, our funders. I want to thank, of course, the web itself and the early nascent community that formed and the support they had for working with academics. It's very easy to, when something is commercially booming, work only with companies. Uh, but in fact, we use our technology. Some of the early advocates of REST, who are when I talk about specifically practitioners advocating Roy's work without him in the room in different debates and different forums, these are the kinds of things that they did. Um, and of course, there's that larger colleagueship. It is not merely that over a period of um, this two decades that we had many overlapping relationships as students, TAs, mentors, housemates, office mates, but also with many associated faculty and other researchers as well. And of course, a genuine thanks to the community for the award, uh, not just from Roy's behalf, as I said, but and those of us who had the benefit of um, working on related work over the years. And so, uh, with that bit of time travel, you can see uh, several faces there that really the co author sat on this paper. I'd like to invite uh, Dick Taylor to join us up for questions and answers as well. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Questions, please. Who want to get started? Uh, well, if someone lines up with the mic, I'd probably challenge both of them to say, Was this sweet generous? What do you think about this lesson could be done if someone's starting out today in the audience and looking at an interesting field? Uh, is this kind of success in this need for it? Well, I, I'd like to, to point out what, when I started um, as a grad student, I wasn't just out of a uh, bachelor's degree. Um, what happens when I, when I graduated from high school, I started work as a software engineer as a, in the software field, um, having learned a couple languages on my own in high school, uh, but basically just to pay for my college 
education. My, my college was international politics and physics. My, that, those were my, my uh, majors. And I spent a lot of time studying international politics. I spent a lot of time studying physics. Um, but what I found was the creativity of software was far more enjoyable than the other aspects of my education. And what happened though is that after I, I, I transferred to UCI to get an undergraduate degree, went out to work in industry, and I got put in that mold of a first year software engineer where you're going from this to going from that. And, and didn't really have the freedom to do things. And so what brought me back to graduate school was more than anything else the need to have the freedom to pursue the subjects that I was the most passionate about or that I was most interested in. Um, more than just the, the need to get the degree. Uh, I would say if I were to give any advice to uh, PhD students now, if you want to have impact like these gentlemen have, the thing you have to care about is you have to care about the subject more than the degree. You have to care about the work more than the publications. If you're a professor, you have to care about the long-term impact and not your age index. Because if you have your focus on the degree or on this year's publication cycle, you know, yeah, you'll get those things. Congratulations. Good on you. But it's not going to really matter for the long run. If, if you want to have the impact, you have to be passionate about these topics. And all of these students that I've had, I have encouraged them in this way to say, do something that actually has merit, that you actually feel passionate about. And if you run after that, all the other stuff will come along the way too. Thank you for saying that. Good. There's time for more questions. So please, uh, questions anyone? But there's lots of wisdom standing here. Well, so much wisdom. Yes, please. <laughs> Meanwhile, we are going to move you here to the middle. This is a wonderful photo. I want to see that. Okay, so there is a lot of interest um, and pressure on publishing in, in the software engineering research community. And people very carefully optimize their publication agenda to work out what the least publishable increment is and get away with it. Um, now it strikes me that your work, particularly Roy, if you had to go through the hoops of defining HTTP1 on the side and also setting up the Apache Software Foundation, that would largely be detrimental from, from the publication. Um, what are the sorts of um, Advice that you, what is the sort of advice that you can give to um, tenure committees and um, uh, uh, PhD committees on valuing um, all the work that PhD students might have done that is not published, or at least not published in academic contexts? Well, the, the, the main thing that I would suggest in terms of the, the academic degree process would be to look beyond <coughs> Um, just the peer-reviewed journals as the publication process. Uh, because in the sense that it recognized that writing standards is a peer-reviewed process, it's just a slightly different mechanism for it. Rather than presenting a paper and getting rejected or accepted, what you're doing is presenting a paper and negotiating with the community whether it's acceptable or not. So there's, there's a lot of intellectual input that's not your own that is going into this process of producing a standard. But there is still a significant amount of your own work in there as well. And if I had received no credit at all for the standards work that I was doing, then it would have been very difficult for me. Fortunately, you know, Dick was very supportive. Um, the 
UCI was very supportive uh, because uh, service, <laughs> well, not financially supportive, but you know, they're, they're pretty supportive of me in terms of my, my graduate career. You have no idea what I have to do to protect you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would get little snippets. My, my dad actually is one of the founding professors at UCI in social science. So I knew all of the stuff that was going on in the background at a, in a theoretical way. I knew what the process was, because my dad had students like me. Um, no, we didn't. Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, so I knew there was going to be a lot of pressure on Dick, and I wanted to finish too. I, I really wanted to finish. No, it's didn't. just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I was a little busy. Um, because every, you know, these things go along, and, I, and you see, gosh, we really need we need to deal with the fact that Microsoft and Netscape are combating, actively combating over the future of the web. What do we do? Well, we create something just as powerful as they are. Like, well, just as powerful as Netscape and Microsoft? Can you do that? Well, actually, you can do that if you get everyone who's collaborating on the web to collaborate in open source. Build, a, build a, a foundation around that, make it possible for what is now 4,000 people to actively volunteer at the Apache Software Foundation. And you can do that. 4,000 people all working together on systems that keep the web open and free. And I, I look back and say, well, which one's more valuable? Do I, <laughs> do I write a paper for the next conference or do I do that? And that was always the, the trouble I had. So I always had something that was just so incredibly more interesting than writing a paper. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, you know, along those lines. And it really, it drug out until um, in 2000, basically what happened, I helped start a services company and the services company encountered the end of the stock market in the dot-com crash. And because the stock market crashed, and you know, the service industry wasn't so good. That's that's what enabled me to finish the dissertation. Hands <laughs> 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 up. Thanks. Okay. Slide discuss later. Thanks. <laughs>